Welcome to Between the Horns for this week two edition. I'm Cameron Irwin alongside JV Long and Maurice Jones Drew. This, of course, is presented by your Southern California Toyota dealers. Guys, we're going to take a look back to Detroit as well as looking ahead to the Arizona Cardinals. But first, it's just so great to be sitting with you guys. You ready for this one? Woke up to an earthquake this morning, right and early. <laughs> Did you? Ready to go. You didn't feel it. No, I was flying in, so I, I had no idea what was going on. I just landed and everything seemed like it was in place. <laughs> but yeah, good to be here. Good to see you. I think a lot of our audience knows that Cameron like designs her own clothing, right? Yeah, this might I be wish, one of my favorites. I wish I could say this was on on me, but it's not. Oh, okay. And uh, we might we might actually have a new wardrobe showcased on game day. I'm looking forward to that. It Week three against me. the Niners. I like the hello. I'm a I'm a Rams fan patch. I need yeah, one of those. Officially a part of the Ramley. That's for sure. And how about MJD like selling everyone <laughs> here on the YouTube channel? Like go watch Mike up with Kobe Turner. He's sitting exactly <laughs> like Kobe Turner did on the sideline. In Listen, Detroit. man, I, I can see why he says this is comfortable. <laughs> you and Bobby Brown and me. There you go. Converted. Just, that's right. Let's just hang out and chill. Just <laughs> cross your legs, relax, get the blood flow going. So when we go back out there, we can, you know, get a good stop this on this Sunday. Well, I'm just grateful that I actually get to see you instead of your son on the timeline because his highlights <laughs> have been everywhere. He has been everywhere. <laughs> I have to. Uh, it's funny. I think I'm more like big headed than he is because like it's like they ask me first. And then, like, I have to review it, and then he gets to add on after. So I'm like, oh, bro, you know, you do good. I look good. It's all the same. All right, guys. Well, let's take a look back to Detroit, the 20-26 to 26 loss. But we saw 17 straight points uh, unanswered from the Rams. It was so impressive, especially in that second half. I just want some of your initial thoughts based off of the performance you saw from them, JB. Man, I talked three hours for that one. I feel like I haven't stopped since. So you two go first. I've got a whole <laughs> list of things I want you to have first crack at it, and I'll, I'll bat clean up. Uh, offensively, it felt like a breath of fresh air again. Right? You see Cooper Cup out there, Matthew Stafford, really on the same page. Uh, obviously, when Puka Nakua goes down, after they kind of got him going, I was like, oh, my God, they got him going. This, is, this, this could get ugly, you know? Um, and I thought once he went down to see Cooper Cup, really take on that role again it was awesome to see, especially coming from last year, to see them fight through all the adversity, the different guys going out, other guys stepping in and still finding a way to take the lead late in that game. Um, it was awesome. I, I just think that, you know, I obviously wanted them to run the ball a little bit more, uh, but Kyron ran well. He had a big run against Anzalone, who was like the enforcer at the time, and he yeah. turned his head, right? And so it's like, okay, it's there. All the stuff that we were thought that would be there, it's there. It's just getting more consistent play. Obviously, when the guys get healthy and get going, the Rams are going to be a team to be reckoned with. But it's, you know, the, the number one av ability is availability. You got to get guys available so you can showcase that all the time. But to go to that hostile environment, to compete and play the way they played, uh, put a lot of people on notice in the NFL, for sure. I mean, the amount of adversity, we can go through the list of injuries, and we will give you the injury update here shortly. But it was quite the response from the Rams, especially in the second half. You want my checklist? I got Give me a whole the checklist. card worth of things. When <laughs> Cameron says, what do we learn in defeat? But look, I think we all feel the same way, that there were a lot of positives. But let me preface it by saying what I think represents all of our feelings, which is the shelf life of a moral victory is no more than seven days. If you don't take a moral victory and turn it into an actual victory the next weekend, it's nothing but a disappointing loss. And I know we're going to break out both the defense and the quarterback in just a second, but I have to start by saying, once again, it was obvious there was only one quarterback in the building at Ford Field capable of doing what Matthew Stafford did. Yeah. So in case there's any doubt, and I don't think there should be, who got the better end of that deal, the Rams still have the best quarterback in that trade, and he's still very much in his prime. That's what I come away thinking. Now, in no other particular order, I think Bo Limmer's a draft steal oh. and has a future at center, right? Unbelievable. A future that's probably going <laughs> to yes. continue this Sunday. Um. Cam Curl, Colby Parkinson for a franchise that doesn't often participate in that first window of veteran free agency. Super savvy signings for position groups that need their presence. Um, you can roast me in the comments section for this one, but fourth and four, second quarter, there's no such thing as take the points, especially not with a rookie kicker. I'm glad that Cardi got off to a nice start. He had already hit a 41 yarder, but to me, that was a good decision by Sean McVay to go for that one. Yeah. Put it in the hands of Matthew Stafford. It's a shame Cooper Cup dropped it, but. That's a touchdown. That, that is nine out of ten times, that's a touchdown. I mean, he catches the ball, you spin out, that's a touchdown. Um, and then regression to the mean is real. It's not fair, but it's real. The Rams were one of the elite offenses last regular season in red zone conversions. First half of this year, Matthew Stafford turns it over uh, for the first time in the red zone since 2022, right? 
Last year, they're one of the healthiest teams in the league, especially the healthiest offensive line. Next thing you know, they're down three guys before halftime, right? So that's just the way this game goes. That's the way math works. I don't like it, but that's the reality. And then lastly, I'll say, even though they had every right to feel they could have won that game and earned the win, there was a lack of situational mastery there at the end. There were a couple of physical mistakes, right? Like Kobe Durant played a phenomenal game, but if he intercepts that ball at midfield, the Rams get it on the 50. Instead, they punt, the Lions punt, and the Rams get it on the 11. That's a completely different setup. No question. That third down conversion from Stafford to Demarcus Robinson, like that is not for the faint of heart. Do not try that at home. But once you get that, that's a game you got to win. You go false start with 231 after that, Kyron runs out of bounds and stops the clock for the lines with 226, and then you go incomplete, you punt it away with 221. Above the two-minute warning, the line's still holding two timeouts. Like, that's what decides wins and losses in this league, whether you're good or you're not. And the Rams, as well as they played, did not do enough in those critical moments. And you speak to the reality that we saw on offense, and I think one of the other aspects, we, you, you discussed it, looking to the defensive side of the ball, I think that was one of the areas that probably encouraged Rams fans the most, and especially encouraged me the most. Uh, Quentin Lake, team best 10 tackles, but I also looked to the linebacking core because there were a lot of question marks, right? You think mm. of Ernest Jones and the trade yeah. that took place. What's your perception of how those guys performed? I mean, they, they graded terribly. They did, but is that true? And I didn't true? understand that because in real time, I thought they were firing. I, I, I think the grades are kind of just black and white. I think as a announcer, as a person that we're all around this team, the, the, where they were thrown into, mm -hmm. I thought they played exceptionally well, right? I thought you're put in a position to play. You guys normally don't play this all the time. Uh, Trey Reed had the green dot. He's calling the plays. Roseboom's like covering guys. They, I thought they played exceptionally well. I don't know necessarily when like you grade out, maybe it's like, oh, he could have made a tackle here or did that. Mm -hmm. But we talked about it. Like the big question mark was, how is this defense going to look? Right? Those guys showed up both in the running game, early in the game, not not overtime, which we'll get to in a little bit, but in the pa in key passing situations to hold St. Brown to what they held him to. Mm -hmm. Right? Took him away. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, you had uh, Jameson Williams had a bigger day, but it still wasn't like he had a he had that big touchdown. That was pretty much it. Maybe a reverse here or there, but they did everything that you want to do. They did enough to help you win that game. And that's what you're supposed to do when you're rebuilding your defense, a new play caller, and then you have Matthew Stafford, Cooper Cup, and all these other guys on the offense. Your defense is supposed to keep you in the game and allow you to win it. So to me, I thought they played exceptionally well. Uh, there's a couple mishaps that you're going to get. A double move, that's going to happen, right? you got to tackle the guy in that situation. You just can't hit him. you got to tackle him. But then other than that, I thought the secondary did well. You talked about Curl. He showed up a ton in the game, in the run game. Um, and I thought, to be honest, Jared Verse, like, is everything that we thought and more. Yeah. Like the reason yeah. Florida State's as bad as they are now is because we have their two best players <laughs> on our team. I'm just, I'm just being honest. Like, wouldn't you say like, I'm glad Jared Verse is a Ram because yeah. if he was on one of the other 31 teams, I don't think I would like him very much. You know what I mean? Dude, to get a sack, like the Detroit Lions are trying to move down the field at the end of the half, and he just beat Taylor Decker like that. Like it was real quick. Ooh, sack. All right, we're done. We don't even want to get our quarterback hit again. We don't even want to try it. Right? And that's the kind of play that you want to expect that you you expect from guys like Aaron Donald to do and things like that I'm not saying he's at that caliber but to make that play in that situation is huge you talked about situational awareness yeah that was a big play well, it matters this week too because left tackle is probably the strength of the Cardinals which we'll get to that matchup he aligned over left tackle almost exclusively that's going to be a big deal what's the um what's the Shaq meme where he's like oh you apology I was not familiar with your game oh yeah, yeah. I feel like a lot of people out there like Chris Shula I owe you an apology I was not familiar with your game First year defensive coordinator and his staff, they met the moment. To your point, like holding a team like that to 20 points in regulation, if that's the hurdle this Rams offense has to clear week in and week out, I think they're going to win a lot of games. And there's a name that you didn't even mention, and it's his highest grade since week 15 of 2022, and that is John Johnson. Oh, he had oh, a thank goodness he massive, keeps coming back. massive game. It was so impressive. He graded out, I, I believe, at about a 91. It was phenomenal. It, it's funny because uh, he's kind of like that teddy bear that when you have a bad day, you want to go home and get in the bed and cuddle <laughs> with something. That's John Johnson. It's like, hey, Rams defense, we need help. John Johnson, come back over. Let's go play safety. But right? what he allowed you to do, because I think you agree, corner is going to be a work in progress. Yeah, like always. the Rams have not arrived anywhere close to the final solution at corner. 
But when you have a John Johnson, it frees up Quentin Lake to go play that slot corner role, that star role. It, it helps out other areas of your team, which was super important dealing with someone like Amon Ross St. Brown. And he's been in this system for how long? Like yeah. He's been there, so he's a coach on the back end, right? He knows where the holes are in the defense. He, that the play he made on the interception, he knew that I could rob this because we were locked up on the backside. I can rob anything yeah. coming inside. And he took a chance to rob it. Well, let's remember his rookie year. Was it against Seattle? We got caught. Remember, we got caught. Same situation. He, his first start, wasn't his it? His first start, he gets a pick, does a great job reading it, jumps it. And that's what you want. You want a guy that's not afraid to go out and try to make plays to help get the ball back for your offense. Not for the defense. we got to get back to this coaching quarterback, right? <laughs> Take us there, will you? No kidding. Uh, so we'll get further into that uh, in terms of the matchup. But we also, before we get to the quarterback situation, we need to have a little bit of a conversation, some injuries, just to understand where we're heading into week two. A couple updates for you. As we have placed three on injured reserve, Steve Avila, Note boom and Puka Nakua. That's going to cause some major differences uh, on the offensive front. We look to the offensive line for week two. Give me a couple names, JB, to look for because Bo Limmer, they asked for it on Twitter. They want more love for Bo yeah. Limmer, who made his first career start. Uh, thoughts on him? I honestly have no idea how it's going to look this Sunday in Glendale. And I'm not saying it doesn't matter, but I do think time on task is as important as talent in a situation like this. Like, give McVay, um, give LaFleur, give Ryan Wendell three practices and four quarters of the consistent five up front, and I think you're going to get a lot better results. Mm -hmm. That's a lot to ask for, I get it. But no matter who's in those seats, continuity, please. And, and what Sunday told me is that you've got a unique coach and quarterback combination that they can solve for just about everything else. I, I, I mean, I think I said it on air when we were calling the game is that those reps that happened in the preseason – they're actually paying dividends now. Normally, mm. it's like down the road a little bit. It's like yeah. you got three full games of Bo Lemmer and a bunch of other guys out there getting reps and playing Logan Bruss, all these guys. They, they may have to step in. And like you said, with a week of practice, a week of preparation, how can we do certain things? Uh, what we, can we do to protect the quarterback, protect the certain guys on the line? We'll be able to do. Um, I always say this, in any any – critical moment or critical time the Rams have always been in. They found a way to go back to 2018. If you remember that, 2019, it was, remember what, 2000 was 17, 18, they had the healthiest offensive line. 2019, everyone got hurt, right? And then they went back to 2018's playbook. 20, was it 22? Mm -hmm. Same thing, right? Go back to the playbook and start winning games because that playbook is helped. If you watch the game, if you watch it as it goes, they started going back to their bootleg, their rollouts, the, the, all the little things that we saw made the Rams so special in 2018. I expect to see a little bit more of that, more with the running game, and a little bit more of that the quarterback getting out of the pocket. I'm, I'm laughing because playbook, yes, play sheet, no. Yeah. Like, if, if you were to take a look at the play sheet Sean McVay had on the sideline, I mean, he could have ceremonially burned that thing, yeah. and it wouldn't have mattered. He could have walked said the, he did. He could have walked that over to Dan Campbell and said, hey, take a look. This is what we were planning on. None of it's going to work the rest of the night, so we're not going to bother. Like what he and Matthew Stafford did, I'm saying this out loud to remind myself as much as anything. I think our audience knows. This is not going to last forever, right? 9, 10 to McVay, this is not going to last forever. The supercomputers that they have between their ears, that was a really, really unique second half. And it was amazing. It's not sustainable. Like Matthew Stafford cannot lead the league in attempts. Cooper Cup cannot lead the league in targets and catches. Otherwise, it may be great for your fantasy team. It's not going to be great for the 24 Rams, right? Um, but I want to talk about what you said, which is like you would have liked to see them run the ball a little bit more, right? And I, and I saw a lot of that, too. I had a lot of inbounds like that. But, like, take us inside that huddle. Given what they were dealing with, there was no world in which they were running the no, ball, right? Like, you, you need rehearsals. You need reps. You need to know who the guy on your left shoulder is. Well, I, I think what I meant by run the ball is, like, there are certain situations, maybe first down, maybe third and short, maybe second down, just there was a draw play that we ran that – that it was like third and 20. Right, that's and what Kyron, we're telling, that, right? That, that's, what, that's what we need to do just to help your tackle go forward a little bit, right? You're, you, uh, AJ O'Kerry, was, he was going backwards too much, and you had Hutchinson over there. Let him go forward just a little Use bit. Use the line's aggression yes. against them. That's what exactly. the delays and the draws were and all that's, about, And right? that's, what, that's what I was looking for, just to help your line so that when you do drop back, they have to respect. Like, maybe this may be a draw going forward so you don't have to pin your ears back. And just go to protect See, the I, I was looking, bit. and we were talking about this as the game was going on. Like, look at how they found a way to get off the drive on first down, right? Yeah. Like, 
there were more speedos out there in Detroit than the Summer Olympics people. <laughs> like they were running speed out to the sideline and Stafford was throwing it where only Cooper Cup could get oh, it. Yeah. Otherwise it was the ball boy. That was it. And they were getting into first or second and five, second and six, whatever mm -hmm. it was. Um, that was critically important. Now, again, if you can regroup this week at practice, I don't know the five that they're going to trot out there against the Cardinals, but I do know the Cardinals are not the lines defensively. And I also know that this identity of the Rams that we've come to know and love, like their downhill rushing attack, the genesis of all that, two games against the Cardinals last year. I was about to say, they, <laughs> the one team they know how to play against is Arizona. Week six, second half against the Cardinals, they come out, they hand it off eight times and they realize they've got something. Now, unfortunately, Kyron got hurt in that game, so did Ronnie Rivers, but as soon as he comes back, where do they land? Glendale, Arizona. What do they do? Well, it goes back, it always goes back to uh, CJ. Anderson. First game off the couch. Hey, come out here and play running back against the Arizona Cardinals. Here goes 20 carries. Like, we're running the ball. And so, I don't, as much as I, I don't like to call it a get right game, but you have, you've had a lot of success against Arizona offensively, right? So, to me, it's, if it's going to be any team that we're going to be in this situation with the first game, mm -hmm. I'd love it for it to be Arizona. Is there cause for concern just in terms of facing Arizona? There's a lot of conversation about their health and how good Kyler's looking, his ability to run. You talked about Jared Verse, Braden Fisk, obviously stepping up and needing that pass rush specifically. I mean, there's probably nobody more happy to see Aaron Donald retired than Kyler Murray at this point. So where do they go in terms of the defense and is there cause for concern? I feel like you have the Kyler rules. We, we know what the Kyler rules are. It's keep him in the pocket, make him throw through the trees. That's what Jack DeRuce always tell us when we were playing shorter quarterbacks, right? Drew Brees, uh, specifically Drew Brees, like make him throw through the, the guy's hands. Mm -hmm. uh, was it, it was Raheem, the one time that they lost to Arizona in, at SoFi, they were doing all these stunts and blitzes and Kyler gets out of the pocket like, no, no, no. He's, that's what he wants to do. Rush the edge, keep him in the pocket, rush to him, not, a, not past him, and then collapse a pocket on him and make him throw it. You know the coverage that he struggles with. Continue to do that. It's not – that's what you have to do. Like certain – there's certain teams when you play and there's certain coordinators and certain players, you always do what you have success, uh, success against, right? Like if it's uh, – I don't know. Let's say if it's, if it's the San Francisco 49ers, it's Brock Purdy, Right. We make him roll the opposite way. You don't mm -hmm. want him rolling to his right. You want him rolling left. That's the only that's he's great in the pocket. He's great rolling right. When he rolls left, it's not as good, right? And so everyone has kind of a deal. Kyler is he's great rolling out of the pocket. Either way, we got to keep him in the pocket mm -hmm. because now he has he can't he can't run and use his superpower. So if you could keep him in the pocket, it changes everything. Maurice has been hearing me tout the Cardinals and their improvement for like six months now. He's probably sick of it. And I would love to be wrong about that. I would love to believe at the end of this year that they're not as improved as I think they could have been. But I saw him go out and take a two touchdown lead and score in their first three drives in Orchard Park last week. Like that's what I expected the Cardinals to look like. Um, what I wasn't expecting is them to line up in three tight end sets and lengthen that offensive line. Uh, James Conner is a problem. He is third in the league in rushing since the start of last season. He's right up there with McCaffrey and with Kyron. Um, Marvin Harrison Jr. had a terrible debut, and I think that's going to be a huge focus this week. Like, do they spam him? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Got to keep him happy. Okay. So that's something to watch for sure. Um, but you're right. It, what you said is true. Like, Aaron Donald's not walking through that door. Thankfully for the Rams, I think they got a bunch of young pass rushers ready to kick that door down and treat Kyler the same way. But I'm not naive to the fact that Kyler's played MVP caliber football for long stretches of time. And then twice a year, Aaron Donald walks into his life and it changes. But when he's been out there, they've been good. Yeah, I think the biggest question mark for me heading into this next matchup is actually the run defense, just based off of what you totally. saw from from James Conner this past week and the Bills. They utilized him heavily and considering what we saw the Rams do with Detroit. I mean, it was it was tough, especially considering that overtime drive. By I, I, I would say the Lions. It's, it's a different it's a different run scheme, though. OK, and that that's the one thing that saves the Rams. It's going to be more shotgun run. If it is under center, it's going to be more duo where Detroit is like gap scheme where they're going to block down, pull guys, kick guys out, be more be more physical, if that makes sense. Like they're trying to punch holes through you where I think the Cardinals are more of a kind of a uh, position blocking team like hey I got my guy position you got to get around me does that make sense like it's just a, it's a different type of run scheme that you're going to see I hear you and I was just about to say except the quarterback is a completely different dynamic exactly. you can't go more polar opposite than Jared Goff to Kyler Murray except of course Jared Goff has that scramble which kind of breaks your game of course
on Sunday Night Football. I'm still not over it. Sorry. <laughs> As you can tell, yeah. I was but you got, say, but you got to watch Kyler extended yeah. drives. Like when when he can turn, you know, third and plus to you know first and then the drive yeah. extended. Uh, that's where you get in trouble. That's where you do get some of those fatigue moments. Mm-hmm. All right, I want to bring us up a notch uh, and actually go back towards the offensive side of the ball because I had a thought this week as obviously the news of Puka Nakua's injury, the reaggravation to his knee, it was everywhere, and I just envision his relationship with Cooper Cup last season and what Cooper Cup did in that same position. Mm on the sidelines and I feel like the way has been modeled for Puka Nakua in this in this position it's not an opportunity we ever want to see him in but especially with someone like whether it's Tyler Johnson or Whittington in the mix I mean he has an opportunity to still have a massive impact on that room and the way has been modeled by him yeah well said I like that yeah, I, I, I agree I, I think though his biggest impact though is getting as healthy as possible absolutely right just because the way they were when before he hurt his knee, the way they were like throwing the Cooper Cup, and then you saw him come open and he started catching the ball. It was like, who do you stop right now? Granted, the other guys can came in and did their part, and they're awesome. Tyler Johnson with the long run, wanted him to score. He's like, get to the house on those type of plays, right? Um, but for Coop, uh, for Puka Nakua, it's, it's getting as healthy as possible. It, again, it's it's a blessing in disguise. I feel like because he's being him being banged up is going to open up the door and opportunities for other guys to get better. And we all know this is a marathon, right? This is not a sprint. It's, it's a war of attrition. So down the line, you're going to have some of these guys are going to have to make plays. They're just going to get those valuable reps now while Puka's getting healthy. And once he gets healthy, awesome. The key is you're talking about the mental part. Or the, yeah. Cooper Cup is going to handle a lot of that, though. He's going to be, a, he's going to be more of a, a coach player, player coach, or however you want to call it, because he's going to have to get those guys on the same page as Matthew Stafford and what he's used to seeing as well, similar to what he did to Puka Nakua last year. I was thinking this week about how when Blake Corum was drafted, we all had the same thought, like, oh, there's a Kyron Williams clone, right? They're trying to make sure that if anything happens to Kyron, they don't have to change a thing. The first month of the season or more could actually be about what if Jordan Whittington was that player for mm-hmm. Puka Nakua? Like, I think they've got other guys can, who can do it in different combinations. Tyler's one. I think Tutu Atwell gets right in the mix this week. But in terms of making your run and pass marry together, making pre-snap run look like pass, pass look like run, you got to have unique body types to do that. And that's what makes Puka Nakua and Cooper Cup so great. And I think Whittington, from what we saw, not just in those preseason games, but throughout the offseason program, like the fact that he got a taste week one in Detroit, I think bodes really well for his opportunity in this window of time. Yeah, almost more so a tease, right? Yeah. For Whittington having that touchdown called back. That was that was a tough one for him, no doubt about it. Um, but you mentioned Blake Corum, and it was funny online. You asked what, what people wanted us to talk about on the show, and the name Blake Corum came up several times. And you it. said you weren't surprised to ne- not necessarily see him out there. For a couple of reasons. One, because, again, I work with the president and the CEO of Run the Ball, Inc., right? So I deal with this every week, and I I love it. But that was not a game where you're going to feature your running backs. It it just wasn't. And then also, like, hostile road environment, silent count. You're you're shuffling chairs on your offensive line. Like, getting to the third spot on your running back depth chart I don't think was the priority. I think it speaks to Ronnie Rivers, the trust that he's earned. It's always been hard for a first-year back to earn trust and reps in this offense, whether it was Todd Gurley um, or, or now Kyron Williams kind of being a three down, every down back. Yeah, I, I think it just takes time, right? When you put a rookie out there, you want them to be successful, right? You want to put him in the best situation to be successful. For a receiver, completely different than it's for a running back, right? The different protections, the calls, it's loud. If you make one mistake and your quarterback gets hit, that's an issue uh, in the passing game. And I, I think when you look at it, as good as a, a runner he is and as smart as uh, Blake Corum is, you just don't want to put him in a situation to fail, right? And I get it. He went back home to Michigan, and the Michigan fans were there, and they wanted to say, I get all that. I understand that. But I want to be able to put you in a position to play where I know that you have more a chance to be successful than fail. I, I remember my rookie year. It was the same thing with me. I was so upset. I forgot. Played the Cowboys week one. Mm. I remember this like it was yesterday. We played the Cowboys week one. Played him at home. Terrell Owens, they had uh, the safety from Oklahoma, uh, Roy Williams. They had all these big-name guys, DeMarcus Ware. I go out there, they make a check, and I have to block DeMarcus Ware, and I give up a sack. I was like, I'm like, first of all, they're paying this guy $10 million. Why am I blocking him? <laughs> but it put me in a situation where, like, that was my first play, and it was a failure, right? And the coaches were like, bro, get out. Don't worry about it. We'll, we'll figure it out. And later in the game, I got a chance to play and redeem myself. But you don't want that, that first play in the NFL to be a negative because it weighs on you a little bit. It starts to, you start to question yourself a little bit. 
his time's coming. He's oh, going to have coming. great moments this year. Yeah. I just don't think you need to rush it so long as you're top back. Maybe one of the best backs in the league is right there and able to take those snaps. All right, guys, I'm going to throw one at you here. Uh, you cannot answer Matthew Stafford or Cooper Cup, but who is one to watch for the Ramley uh, against the Cardinals this coming week? Go ahead. I don't want to steal it. Go ahead. I would probably say one of the edge rushers. Oh, wow. I think Jared Verse is the obvious answer. I think his matchup against Paris Johnson uh, is going to be one of the best ones to watch in this game. Um, but Jonah Williams, the right tackle for the Cardinals, got hurt in week one at Buffalo. So he's going to be replaced probably by Kelvin Beecham, who did not play as well stepping in. We'll see what he does with a full week of preparation. Agent Zero, go have yourself a day for sure. I yeah. think I think edge tackle both directions, both directions is probably the matchup to watch in this game. Yeah, to me, it's going to be this is all about this game is all about Kyron. I, I think the last time we went to Arizona and played, he had three touchdowns, right? He had three a, touchdowns yeah. last season. Two, yeah. yeah, two receiving touchdowns. Two receiving last touchdowns. Year. Yeah, but um, over two hundred from scrimmage. Yeah, so to me, it's it's about Kyron. It's a it's a Kyron type of game. I know Matthew Stafford, Cooper, Cooper, they're going to have their day, but to me, it's about Kyron going out and taking over this game. Big runs that he had there. Yeah. The Rams have always run well there. He has to make sure that they have to put eight in the box to open up the passing game with the play-action pass. So if he has success, especially with the different O-line, it's like I said, it's always easier for O-linemen to go forward than it is to kick set and go against a guy that's probably more athletic than you while you're going backwards. It's, not, it's never the best thing. So if you can get a good running game going, the play-action pass should open up. You know who I huge. thought you were going to say? Every time we go to Arizona, every time. Oh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm saving it. For, don't, 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 I'm saving it. Oh, it's it. coming out on the broadcast. It's saving it. You know. Oh yeah, give me give me his initials, CP. You right? Come on, can we just tell him? Go ahead, go ahead, and tell him. Every time we go to Arizona, he's like Tyler Higby Day incoming. No <laughs> question. This is Tyler Higby Day, and so I thought since he's not going to play, that you were just going to go Rams tied in. Oh, the, Colby I Parkinson. mean that's 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 always been the case down there. It's it's I told you it's, it's funny stuff. For whatever reason, it's like the circle of life. Every time you go somewhere, you have success. Tyler Higby would have a terrible season unless he's playing the Eagles or the Cardinals. And it has to be Arizona in Arizona, right? And Philly in Philly. It has to be Philly in Philly. But when he plays the Cardinals, for every whatever reason, he scores two or three times. I told, remember that. Was it last year he scored two times? I put it in my fantasy. I was like, I put it in my fantasy this week. <laughs> scored two touchdowns. Join us uh, on Rams Radio at about 12.55 Pacific time on Sunday. And you'll hear Maurice Jones-Drew say the exact same thing yeah. he just did. Kobe because... Parkinson, huge signing, big day. Big Kyron, day. Kyron Williams, Kobe. It would be good. All right. Well, you got your keys. Who's yours? Oh, that's a good question. Ooh. See, you threw it out to us. You got to be ready. I am. Actually, I, I'm going to go uh, John Johnson. I was really impressed. I, I liked – and you know what? Actually, I think back. There was one specific play that stood out to me for him as well as Quentin Lake, and it was after the Rams scored starting the second half, and it was the next three and out, and it was their final – their last tackle on that series that was superb, crashing down in the box. I was just – I was floored by their physicality. So I'm, I'm going with John Johnson. Can I, can I say one last thing? The one thing that we haven't talked about, I tried to mention it a couple of times on the broadcast, this is a much fi more physical defense with Chris Shula at the helm. Have you noticed that? Even in the preseason. Tell us more. Just like Spate in the preseason. Spate in the preseason. He was hitting everybody. Neil mm -hmm. hitting everybody. Guys, safeties were coming down. McCullough was coming. Everybody was just way more, had more of a reckless abandonment of how they played fast, physical. You go to Detroit – and I'm like, I'm like, ah, we saw these young guys doing the preseason. Does it carry over to the regular season? And I feel like the Rams defensively were way more physical, way more physical than Detroit was offensively. I mean, they were be hitting guys. I mean, the first play when Montgomery was it wasn't Montgomery. I think it was Roseboom hit Montgomery on the first play of the game, and they like turned his head, snapped his head a little. I was like, oh, okay, oh, this isn't the this isn't the high flying Rams defense that's trying to get turnovers and get to the quarterback. This is the defense that's going to hit you in the mouth play after play after play, which is going to bode well as you get ready for other teams on the stretch. Which is what was so unfortunate about that overtime drive yeah. is they were fatigued, uh, their tongues yeah. were dragging, and they started breaking tackles, the lines did, and it, it spun a different takeaway than what you both established earlier in that contest. There was so much conversation last year about the no-name defense, right, and trying to find the identity of this defense. And coming into this, we've been looking at the Rams from an offensive standpoint time and time again. I mean, they're predicated on offense, but – if there's a spot for the Rams fans to be excited, I think defensively that's where we're showing out right now, and I'm stoked to see it in week two. All right, guys, I think we've got our keys into the Cardinals matchup. Uh, thanks so much for joining us here on Between the Horns. It's been a blast having you. For my good friends, J.B. Long and Maurice Jones-Drew, I'm Cameron Irwin, and again, this is Between the Horns presented by your Southern California Toyota dealers.